Good evening. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. This is our Calvary Grace evening service. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, as we study your word, I pray that you'll just have it impact the lives of your people, change perhaps the directions of some, and encourage them in their faith as they study your word with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. We kind of ended with this in the last service. And if you haven't seen that, I encourage you just to watch it as we look at the war that goes on in the heavenlies. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, again, notice it's when and not if, when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith <coughs> with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So the Bible itself, the word of God, is described to us as the sword of the spirit. It's a weapon. Now, I don't mean by that that we should use it as weapons on believers, but it's a weapon against the devil. It's a weapon that we are able to quote Scripture to the devil, who incidentally knows the Bible much better than you. But still, it is our weapon against him. And if you ever want to see this in practice, look at the temptation of Christ as he begins to handle the challenges of the devil by quoting Scripture. So this is a very important thing. This, this, this book that we have called the Bible is very, very important. It is one of our greatest weapons against the enemy. Well, I think it's important to understand that there are a lot of different Bibles out there. A lot of different Bibles. And as long as they'll sell, there'll be even more. I think that... Um, I think that it's a, 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 a real issue for some people who, particularly those that just love the King James, hate the translations. We're going to look at some translations today, but not in the places you think we're going to look. Translations are simply ways of getting what was originally spoken in one language into another language. And if you happen to speak a second or third language, you will know that there are sometimes many ways you can translate one sentence and still be true to what's being said. And so at least that's partly the reason why we have different translations, different people translating the words. Well, the disciple would write, Paul would write, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. Paul is saying, we put forward the Word of God with no hidden agenda. There's nothing secret going on here. And we do not distort the Word of God. Now that's rather interesting considering all they had was the Old Testament at that, st that stage. Paul is in the process of 
writing the books of the New Testament, but all they had as a, as a, as a, as a canon was the Old Testament. And he's saying, listen, we haven't distorted that. We haven't twisted it. There's no secret agenda here. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plain, plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those that are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake or for Jesus' sake. So he's making it very clear. Look, we are not twisting, in this case, the Old Testament. We're not twisting any of this. We're putting it forward to you as straightly and clearly as we can. And I believe that's what most Bible translators are trying to do today. Back in the days when people actually carried physical Bibles, we were just holding that conversation a few minutes ago here, you would get a congregation that had quite a mix of Bibles. Now it's not so much that way because we have electronic devices and with the click of a button, you can switch out of one translation into the next translation and follow along quite easily. And incidentally, it's not only just the click of a button for a piece of software, but there are websites that carry multiple translations. Quite a step up from the old days. I used to carry a book that was four inches thick and it was called 26 translations. And as you would open it out, every two pages would have 26 translations of the same verse. Very heavy. <laughs> now it's all done online, much simpler, much easier, much more straightforward and available everywhere. But people pick their translation and they tend to find their favorites. And a lot of times it depends, not solely, but at least in portion, of your age. Generally, the older folks go for the King James Version. And there's nothing wrong with the King James Version. But there are newer, more simple, easier translations to understand. Now I've heard various movie stars and rather unintelligent comment make. You wouldn't dumb down Shakespeare. You wouldn't change the wording of Shakespeare. Why would you now change the wording of the King James? As though there is something nefarious going on in order to lead the whole world astray. Well, first of all, people do change the wording of Shakespeare all the time. Every few years, somebody brings out a movie of Romeo and Juliet done under current circumstances and, 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 and voicings, language. But putting that aside, the wording of Romeo and Juliet or some other Shakespearean play does not determine your eternal future. So I think while that may be beautiful language, I don't have a problem with somebody bringing it into normal English because somebody else's Eternity may depend on understanding that and not being left behind because of the arcane English. It's a much, much greater threat to the soul to not understand the Word of God as opposed to not understanding Shakespeare. At the end of a Shakespearean play, you can walk away and say, well, that was great work by the actors. That was well written. That's a brilliant play. It's fabulous. And uh, we even enjoyed that English. But there are many that are going to walk away and go, I, I didn't understand half of that. And that's okay. They can go home and think about it, possibly study it if they wish. But in most cases, they're just going to walk away and go, well, I guess that's just not for me. I, 
more of a modern play type of person. But when it comes to the Bible, people must understand it. They absolutely must. Now, has there ever been an attempt by the devil to twist the word of God? Yes. Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Do not under any circumstances assume that I am against the King James Version. I am absolutely not. When I study, I preach out of the NIV, the 1984 edition. I also have right beside, passage for passage, line for line, the King James. So when I'm reading out of one, I've also checked it in the other to be sure that the two line up conversationally. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Now the, word of, uh, now the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from the tree that's in the garden. You must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Again, not if, but when you eat of it, you'll surely die. There was the command. There's the word of God. You are free to eat from all the trees. But in the middle of the garden, or in the garden, there is also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that tree, you must not eat. For when you eat of it, you'll die. Now we jump down to chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals, and the Lord, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say, first of all, casting doubt on the word of God, casting doubt on her understanding and her recollection. Did God really say you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, you must not touch it or you'll die. Now, he did not say you must not touch it or you'll die. That she added. The first thing that he did was he cast doubt on what God said. The second thing was she added a line to it, which was not there. God said, don't eat from that tree because if you do, you'll die. She added, we're not allowed to eat from that tree and we're not allowed to touch it. God didn't say that. You'll surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. In other words, you will for the first time in all of human history have committed an act that is evil. And you'll understand the difference now between good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it and she gave some to her husband, who in my opinion was a little less than smart, who was with her and he ate it. So now you had a fallen pair. What they were going to produce were now fallen children. Had she or had he, yes, had she been the only one that ate, she would have died. He would have gone on. God would have bought another wife. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. And of course, God shows up on scene and brings skins and covers them. It's a picture of a sacrifice for sin. The animals gave their lives, and the skins were now given to Adam and Eve, and that covered their sin. It turned out that the things they made to cover their sin didn't work, and it doesn't work today either. But there you have the very first chapters of the Bible the devil casting doubt on the word of God. And he does that again today. I was listening uh, to a, 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 a man that was supposedly the head of the King James Association in America. And his argument was this, you must read the King James or you're going to hell. It's that simple. And somebody said, well, what about people that don't speak English? They must learn English and read the King James or they're unsaved. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because as 
so stupid. First of all, the New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a very small, some very small passages in Aramaic. The Greek that it's written in is called Koine Greek. And that might be translated or best translated common Greek, conversational Greek. So it was not written with thee and thou and thine in mind. That came from a 1769 update of the 1611 version of the King James. And no matter how many people think they've read a King James, 99.999% have never seen a King James Bible. The original King James came out, for example, with the Apocrypha in it. The books that the Catholic Church receives, but the Protestants don't. Not only that, the spelling and the sentence structure was so difficult that it's in 1769, they come along and rewrite it or re-edit it, let's put it that way. And then throughout the hundred years or so, I think 1864 is the last edition. That's the one that people are reading today and saying, this is the King James. It is our King James. It's not the original King James. I had somebody come to me once and they said, you, you should not be preaching out of the NIV. I said, why is that? Because a king wrote the King James. <laughs> I had somebody else then contact Zondervan and tell them I was preaching out of the NIV. And they tried to get me with a <laughs> copyright strike. It didn't work, by the way. My interest is not to present to you good Elizabethan English, even if it's more pretty, and it is. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. As opposed to, yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, those, they, they comfort me. It's prettier. But I would sooner you go home understanding the word than I've had a pretty experience and walk away going, I don't have a clue what he said, but it sure sounded good. I know people that have come to me and said, you know, we, we, we like coming to your church. We just don't understand anything. So we come once every couple of years and, you know, it's fun, but uh, we, we don't understand a thing. Well, if you don't understand what I'm using now, you'll never understand the King James and other translations of its time. And there have been multitudes of translations, including, incidentally, a Bloomfield translation. And no, no relative of mine. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a, a sincere love for your brothers, a love that, a, a love, pardon me, love one another deeply and from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. King James, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In other words, he has imparted life into this word. And he stands behind it. It's living and enduring. It abides forever. So maybe we shouldn't worry so much about a translation we don't like. Now, there are some out there which I think are absolutely evil. The New World Translation, for example, which is the 
Bible that the Jehovah Witnesses use is an absolute twisting of the scriptures. And if you ever get a Jehovah Witness at your door and they want to have a Bible study and you know your stuff, you take them to the King James. And the reason you take them to the King James is first of all, you know what it says and you're not stumbling around in the dark because of what their Bible says, number one. Number two, the King James Watchtower, pardon me, the uh, Jehovah Witness Watchtower Society printed the King James for 50 years. That was their Bible. So they either have to admit that Pastor Russell, who began the movement, was wrong, and that they had been handing out a false, false gospel all those years, or they have to admit that the King James is, in fact, truly a Bible and an authoritative one. There are some Bibles, such as the New World, that are absolute twistings. I can... I, I made up my mind not to name names, but there are some that I just don't care for. And I'll tell you how I, I determine it. I go to the first line of the Old Testament and the first line of the New Testament, and I see how they've translated the Greek and the Hebrew. And I compare it with what I know. And if it's weird, I'm pretty sure the rest of it's going to be weird. To me, that's just a quick rule of thumb, just an easy way to have a fast look at a translation. If they have the problem with in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, then I know right there and then they're going to have real issues as we get deeper into the text. If they have a problem with in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then I know they're going to have problems with the Hebrew throughout the rest of the text. And so I'll put that translation aside and find out, well, why don't we just stick to the King James? Simple, because not everybody understands that Elizabethan English. Well, do we have the right to use translations? Hmm, quite a question, isn't it? Come with me to Isaiah 53. We're gonna read this a few times in different translations. And you'll see why in a minute. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. By the way, that's how Jesus looked. All these pictures of him with the light red hair and the nicely trimmed beard and the blue eyes and the long Roman nose, rubbish. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. It was not going to be a fashion contest. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God and smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him, and by his stripes or his wounds we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and each one has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Listen to this language carefully. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who could speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, Yet the, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. 
my righteous one will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide this, the spoils among the strong because he's poured out his life unto death and num was numbered among the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now there is Isaiah 53. I only needed to read a couple of verses, but it's just so powerful. I just felt like you had to hear it. There's Isaiah 53 from the NIV. Now I want you to hear something very fascinating that you may not have heard or understood even though you heard it. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, and by the way, this is the Philip I was named after, go to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way was sitting on his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now we just read Isaiah 53. The spirit of the Lord told him, go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, unless somebody explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. First of all, we learn that not everybody that reads the Bible can understand it. Sometimes it takes explanation. It doesn't mean, by the way, that you can never understand the Bible and you should never read the Bible. That's nonsense from the devil. You can understand it. God has put the cookies on the bottom shelf, not the top shelf. Verse 32, the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. Now we just read this. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. And who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. See, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but that's not Isaiah 53. Listen to it again. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. That's so far so good. And as a lamb before his shears is silent, so he didn't open his mouth again. So far so good. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. That doesn't appear in the original. Who can speak of his descendants? For he was taken from the earth. Let me just go back here and read to you Isaiah 53. Amen. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Now, if you've got a brain, you're going to sit there and go, but yeah, that means the same thing. And you're right, it does. But what you may not have noticed is the eunuch is reading a translation. In fact, we know the translation he's reading. He's reading a thing called the Septuagint. He's reading a Greek version of the ancient Hebrew scriptures. And you know what? Philip doesn't come up and go, hold it, buddy, hold it. I'm a Jew, these scriptures are ours, 
you're reading a perversion, even though it's got different wording. He doesn't come up and say, listen, you're not reading the King James. He comes up, he hears what he's reading, and he jumps in with the gospel. See, the gospel is bigger than any single translation. He does not correct him because he's not reading the Hebrew Bible of the time, perhaps the Masoretic text. He is reading Isaiah 53 from a translation. So all these people that come along and say, you must read one particular translation. What are you going to do with people who speak another language? Are you really seriously thinking that they should learn English and then learn Elizabethan English and then read? The, listen, they'll be dead in hell before you get them to the gospel. It is important that we stop majoring on minors and start using the word of God to build people up and strengthen them. In Acts chapter 8, verse 32, we read this. The place of scripture which he read was he was led like a sheep from the uh, to the slaughter, like a, a, a lamb dumb before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. This is the King James Version of it. In his humiliation and judgment, he was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life has been taken from the earth. Now that's very, very different to what the eunuch was reading. But he was led to the Lord from what he was reading. I get so tired of these people that want you to read their translation or you're not saved. Is the King James good? It's absolutely spectacular. Is there something wrong with the King James? Yes, there are things wrong with the King James, but the th good thing about it is we know where the problems are. And since we know where the problems are, we know how to handle it. The exact words he was taken from this life simply don't appear in the original King James. So again, we come to the conclusion that this eunuch is not reading the Hebrew text. He is reading a Greek version of it, a translation. And no mention from Philip about you better toss that out and get yourself a Jewish Bible, because if you don't have a Jewish Old Testament, you're going to go to hell. It's absolute nonsense. Here's another example. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. But God found fault with the people and said, A time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. It will not be like the covenant made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. Now here's the writer of Hebrews and he has just read a translation, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Here's the Hebrew. It's found in Jeremiah 31, 31. A time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It'll not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. Now those words do not appear in the Hebrew. He's reading a translation. So my argument is this. If the writers of the New Testament can read translations, I believe the church today can read translations. Are all translations excellent? No, they're not. Dr. Walter Martin used to say and believe very strongly that the NASB was the most accurate, followed by the NIV. King James was in there. And there are different ways to translate, incidentally. Sometimes things are translated word for word. The Young's translation is word for word. The problem with that is some of the idioms in the original language 
don't follow through into English and don't make a lot of sense. But Young came along and he gave us a translation that is literally word for word for word for word. Young's literal translation it's called. Then you have the paraphrases. There's a number of translations out there like the Living and the New Living that are paraphrases. They've come along and said, what's the thought in here? What's the thought, the prevailing thought here? What does this mean? And they have written that in. Now the problem with that, of course, is that you're dependent on the fact that they get the thought right, which I believe they do most of the time. And then you have translations that are a balance between word for word and a paraphrase, and that's where the NIV and NASB fall in together. There are translations that where possible will give you word for word, but where that doesn't make sense, they'll paraphrase the thought. You should know that there is so little difference. When I read, for example, the Isaiah 53 and mentioned that certain words weren't in the other text, I'm sure if you were listening and thinking, you would have said, yeah, but the same meaning is there. And that's exactly what happens with translations today. The same meaning is there. Let me show you another one, just in case you thought, uh, oh, by the way, there are tons more, but I only have a limited time. Turn to Micah chapter five, verse one. Micah chapter five, verse one. As Dr. Hawking would say, if only to find it. Micah chapter five, verse one. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us, they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one from me who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, now turn over to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one born the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he called together the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophets written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. Now hold it, hold it. That's not what the passage says at all. It says, but though you are small, among the clans of Judah. Now by the time we get here, it says though you're by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. What's happening? These priests and leaders and teachers are using a translation. In fact, they're using the Septuagint. So again, I, my argument stands. Translations were used all the way through your New Testament. And I believe that God has allowed them to be used today to make the Word of God understandable to a generation that doesn't speak Elizabethan English. Once again, is there anything wrong with the King James? No, not, not really. There are some translational errors. We... We know where copyists' notes have got, gotten into the text and things like that. But just laying that aside, it is an excellent translation. And if by any chance you enjoy it and can enjoy it, enjoy it. Get in with both feet. Have a great time. Love it.
Just don't feel like it's more Bible than anyone else's Bible. Because there are areas in the King James that we know are off. But it's still an awesome translation. Why do I use the NIV? I use the NIV because I can read it. I went to my dad in the years when he was preaching. And I said, Dad, wh why, why do you insist on the King James? And I was half waiting for a smart answer because he could be prickly at times. And he said, well, I'll tell you the truth. I grew up on the King James. I memorized it. It's all I know. And to switch to something else now is just too confusing. And I thought, Dad, that is the most honest answer I've ever heard. I understand that. Under those circumstances, I don't think you should switch to anything else. Although I know people are really very happy to quote the NIV when it suits them. I know my plans for you, declares the Lord. You look it up, you'll see what I'm saying. There are people like myself that have memorized certain translations. And once you've memorized something and you just know it off by heart, it becomes a real issue to switch to some other translation. But there will be newer translations coming out more and more and more. And they're not getting further away from the truth. They're getting closer and closer to the original documents. Because now it's not just a few scraps of text that we've dug up out of the dirt. Now it's thousands and tens of thousands. And so we're able, they're able to compare this text with this text with this text with this one and so on until they come down to exactly what was said on the original. Incidentally, you should know nobody has the original autographs. Nobody has the original texts. So with that in mind, listen to this. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Find a Bible you understand. Now I'll tell you what I believe. I believe no one translation is good enough. Get a multitude of them. Get several translations and check things back and forth. So that in the end of a session of reading the word of God, you come away understanding what's being said. And know this. In very few cases did one man do all the translating. Very few. And those that did, we're usually talking about now back in the Middle Ages. But now it's done by committees and by groups. And though they may not have your particular religious bend, they are still doing a good job of translating the Word of God. And there are many fine translations. I always pick the NIV because that's the one I preach from. I always pick the King James because that's the one I check the NIV by. But then I frequently check the Living. I frequently check the NASB. I frequently check Young's. Uh, I think that's about it, actually. These are the ones I frequently check. But I encourage you, have more than one translation available. And don't be afraid to swap over to another translation and check and see if that's what it says or that's what they think it says. Spend some time with the Word of God. In the end, 
you better know what it says your future depends on. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the joy of studying your word. I pray that it will encourage the hearts of your people, that they will be blessed and lifted and encouraged, not discouraged, not led astray. That, Father, for those that don't speak original Koine Greek, nor original ancient Hebrew, nor original Aramaic, we must depend upon translations to our language. And I thank you that you've given us multiple translations so that we can check that something is translated correctly. And in the end, we can walk away knowing the message God wanted to deliver to us from that text. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.